Hello, we are here at the Keystone Symposia in Estes Park, Colorado. I'm here with three beautiful and successful researchers. Hi, I'm Allison Hill. Um, I'm a research fellow at Harvard. And I finished my PhD just a few years ago, and right now I'm in sort of an in-between position between PhD and a professor where uh, I'm part of a special government program to give uh, junior researchers an opportunity to run their own research group for five years uh, before uh, going into faculty positions. So right now um, I work with a small group of two postdocs, two graduate students, and a research assistant um, as a part of a bigger uh, center at Harvard. And my work focuses on uh, mathematical modeling of HIV and some other infections. Um, and I work a lot with many different uh, clinical and experimental collaborators to use models to better uh, interpret data from studies of HIV, uh, as well as to use models to predict outcomes of uh, new potential therapies for HIV. Hi, my name is Sharon Lewin. I'm the director of the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, which is a joint venture of the University of Melbourne and Royal Melbourne Hospital. It's an institute entirely focused on infection and immunity, named after Peter Doherty, who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1996. It has over 700 staff working on all aspects of infectious diseases. Um, my background is I'm an infectious disease physician and uh, basic scientist, sorry, clinician scientist. And I've worked for a long time um, in HIV latency, starting in the late 90s. And I run a large group, about 30 people, with a range of virologists, immunologists, and clinicians. And our main interests are on latency reversal, um, characterizing the reservoir and identifying new immunotherapies, which we test in early phase clinical trials. Hi, I'm Becca Asquith from uh, Imperial College London in the UK. I'm a reader, um, and I'm interested in mathematical immunology. So my background's in physics, but then I crossed over to immunology. Um, I'm particularly interested in understanding the host CD8 T cell response to persistent viruses and using combinations of models and also experimental work to try and understand what is happening in humans, why humans control viruses to different extents, um, and why some people successfully control whilst other people fail to control. I've got a small group, um, mainly theoreticians, but a couple of wet lab guys as well. Thank you very much for this introduction. You have been having a great journey here today, this morning at the Keystone Symposia. What have you learned today? What was your highlight of the day? Well, uh, the highlight of the day, um, well, the, we started off with a fantastic overview from Bob Silicano, who's always a great pleasure to listen to, and some interesting insights around um, antiviral efficacy, which I don't think we've considered much in our models. We've learned a lot about, he talked a bit about um, the role of uh, proliferation in maintenance of latency, which I think is a very hot area, and uh, still a lot of unanswered questions. I enjoyed Alison's talk very much. Um, I'm a big believer that uh, modelling can really help inform us, ask relevant new questions. And um, I uh, think the two studies that Alison spoke about are very interesting studies. Um, so far, they were both set in macaque models, and they've both had um, good outcomes in those studies with two monkeys cured in one study, and most of the monkeys that received a combined intervention being in remission. So the monkey work is well ahead of the human work. We haven't cured anyone yet <laughs> or induced remission. So I'm watching these monkey studies very closely, and I think um, the models that we can generate around them uh, will be very useful. So Alison, can you tell us more about those models and this study? Sure. So I think for me, the highlight of uh, the morning so far, which I think is representative of what the goal of the conference was, to sort of see this interplay between the models um, and the experiments. Um, so you know, often we think of models as something of coming after experiments. So we already have the data, now we want to better understand it. But I think there's been some cool examples of models that um, maybe actually inspire additional experiments. So particularly in Miles' talk, um, the question about trying to get this estimate for this reactivation rate and how that actually led him to work with an experimentalist to design a very cool experiment to try to get at that. Um, I think that's like really an awesome example of, of this interplay. 
Um, and yeah, the studies that I talked about, I, I agree. I think these results are very promising. They really are the only examples of either a sterilizing or functional cure. Um, and even though in monkeys, hopefully, you know, something similar can be replicated in humans. And um, I think that sort of perhaps the disappointing part of it is despite modeling being able to give us some insight, there's still a lot of open questions about what is even going on um, with, the, with the drugs administered there that, that, that modeling really hasn't been able to completely answer yet. So I hope that um, the talk was able to sort of stimulate some discussion and ideas in the rest of the audience and that it'll lead to um, additional work to really figure out uh, what's happening here and then how we can have the best chance of success in the human model. Becca, what's your opinion? Um, I agree. I mean, my highlight was also Alison's talk. I thought it was a beautiful example of how you can use mathematics to really delve into what's happening with latency. And I think it's a, a very exciting, very brave attempt to try and estimate the viral parameters during that process. Um, and I think it's a great example of the sort of thing that you just couldn't do without mathematics. You look at those curves and you say, oh, they all look identical, um, but you delve into it deeper trying to fit the parameters um, and you can see some really striking On the collaboration between mathematics and experimental work, have you faced some challenges in your research and in your career? Yeah, <laughs> great question. And I would love to hear the opposite, the clinician <laughs> side of point of view on this afterwards. So, I mean, I've had extremely positive experiences working with experimentalists and, and clinicians and everything in between. Um, I think the challenges sort of come in the same way of the challenges you would get when speaking to someone from a different culture or <laughs> with a different first language. I mean, different ways of talking about things, different terms, and sort of different things that you focus on. So a lot of it comes down into finding a common language to discuss everything in. Um, and, you know, I think that Another big challenge is always finding the right type of question. You know, there are certain questions that can only be answered with, with more experiments, and there are other questions that really can be helped by the addition of models, sort of to formalize hypotheses, to, to test theories about what those hypotheses would, would predict. Um, and finding that type of question where modeling can have the biggest impact is always the hardest thing, the thing that takes the longest, I think, when you're starting a new collaboration. But if you get it right, it can be extremely successful. Um, I think that, for me, the difficulties of modelling um, are also the excitements of modelling. So, really, that it's a, a very new science. So, you're not, you can't really look to, set to anyone else to kind of copy their ideas or to copy their approaches. You're really having to um, forge your own path, which is much harder, but also when it goes right, it's also much more exciting. Um, so sometimes it feels like quite a slow process, but then the breakthroughs, I think, are, are worth it. Um, so I've worked with modellers uh, quite, from quite early on in my career, so I um, really understand the benefits of it and the fact that it can bring new insights. I think the tensions often come about because modellers want lots of data and lots of time <laughs> points. <laughs> And in human experiments, you can't get them. And also, a lot of the measurements we use for the reservoir are not really, uh, they've got wide confidence intervals and often not super well validated. Um, some of the measurements we use are, but many of them aren't. I mean, even just, you know, the basic you know, assessment of replication competent virus using a viral outgrowth assay, you know, has real limitations. Um, some assays that we've used for a long time to look at latency reversal. Um, I showed some work earlier about how those assays are actually seem to vary with stress and time. And so the assays we use aren't perfect. <laughs> They're often in humans which don't behave, which are all, which are very different to monkeys. We can't sample people as frequently. And I think one area in cure research that's pretty interesting is this move towards treatment interruption as endpoints of studies. Treatment interruption studies are really actually quite hard to do and they're asking our patients a lot of, of them. You know, for people to stop their treatment 
to have very frequent monitoring, potential risks of the interruption. I'm a big believer we need them, but they're act if we move to just looking at treatment interruptions, um, it, it could potentially slow the field down. So there's that mix between the perfect world and the real world, and I think we can both we can learn from each. Thank you very much for sharing your views. Now I want to move to another segment in terms of career perspective, and we have a lot of PhD students attending this conference. So what can you say to young people wanting to pursue research in either the clinical aspect or the mathematical aspect of this field? I would say stick with it. Um, it's, it, it is very challenging. Um, there's a lot of stress from being a PhD student and then to getting your first postdoc position and then getting a more permanent position. And I think a lot of people can be put off by seeing that career path as being really quite rocky um, and quite uncertain. But I'd say it is a fantastic career. Um, you get a real freedom to do what you want. You get to talk to the most interesting people in the world. You know, it's a, it's a unique and brilliant job. So I would say it's worth the stress. Um, and looking back, I'm, I wouldn't want us to do anything else. So like I said, I'd stick with it if you can. <laughs> So yeah, I definitely agree with everything that um, Becca said. And I would also say an important thing is to surround yourself with the right type of people. So you know, certainly, like any field, there, there are people in science who uh, can bring you down and <laughs> have a negative work environment and um, other bad things. And, and really, uh, I think that drives a lot of people away from the field. So I think the most important thing is to find people who work with that you jive with well, people who support you, mentors who will highlight your work as opposed to you know, taking undue credit for it, um, and, and collaborators who you, know, you really feel like it's a mutually beneficial relationship. So I think it's important that you know, no matter how famous you think someone is or how likely it is that you may get a nature paper out of working in a lab, if that's a negative environment, I, I think you should leave it as soon as possible and <laughs> surround yourself um, by, by positive um, productive work environments whenever possible and then um, as Becca said it really can be uh, a very wonderful and rewarding career where um, really you get to spend all of your time thinking about big open questions that no one in the world has the answer to and, and working with um, really brilliant people who are thinking in, in very creative ways to try to solve those problems. Yeah, I agree with um, the comments so far. I would um, also say that in your training, I'd really, um, you want to be in, in uh, functional places, not dysfunctional places, but being in the best place in the world, I think really does um, pay off for your training, at least. I think that it gives you a way of approaching science and a network of collaborators that um, you'll keep for the rest of your career. And I have to think about one um, feature of successful scientists. It's around passion. So you're not, most people do well in science because they totally love what they do. So I think um, if you love what you do, um, you'll be successful. That's, but you need that kind of passion to, um, to get through it, I think. On that passion, I can be passionate about something, but then it's how hard do you work to make that passion a reality? Uh, how do you work to make that passion filling into a job a perspective and then a grant proposal and then being a PI? So how hard do you work? <laughs> do you have any anecdote of how hard you work <laughs> during the past? So I've been told that I have a very good work-life balance and I take pride in that and I think that it's important. I wouldn't have chosen a career where I had to work all the time. So certainly I think the hours in science are not nine to five, but that's something that, that, that I enjoy. So there may be some days when you work very long hours, when you're trying very hard to get something done, um, and, and other days where in the middle of the week you might just have time to go do something fun. So I think that the flexibility of uh, your daily scheduling, at least uh, when you're a, a theorist, a modeler, uh, is one uh, big benefit to the career. Um, the one thing that, that I would say about science in terms of sort of the level of hard work is that it's really you know, something that even when you go home you tend to always be thinking about it and I think that's something that comes down you know, to having the passion. If you're thinking about an interesting problem it's sort of always in the back of your head so you're never really fully off of work at least uh, not me in that sense but I think that's something that I that I very much enjoy about the field. 
Um, just getting back to your question, yes, passion alone is not enough. You need passion and hard work and good training and good collaborators. I mean, there's many other components to being successful in science. Um, I probably, I actually really have two full-time jobs because <laughs> I um, have run a big lab, which I love and I don't want to give up. And it's what um, a big part that drives me and be, you know, something I, I want to do and I also run an institute so I have a um, big responsibility in mentoring other people, creating opportunities for people in the institute and running the place. So um, I'll be pretty upfront. I work very hard and I've worked very long hours. Um, but you know, over the, over the time of my career that's waxed and waned, I have two children who are now in their early 20s when they were young. I worked part time for a period. When they were at high school, I had a much less busy job. And now that they're both sort of out of school, I've taken on a lot more responsibility. So I think your career, um, the time you want to devote to your career changes at different stages of your life. And I think um, one of the great um, advantages of science and in medicine is that you probably get a little bit of flexibility to choose how hard you want to work at different stages. Yeah, I guess I work hard, I work long hours, um, but for me what's important is that that's my decision. There's no one looking at me saying you need to come in at 6, you need to leave at 10. You know, if I work those hours that's my decision um, and for me that's really important and then it doesn't really feel like work. I mean like Alison says, it's, it's kind of always in the back of your mind anyhow. Um, so I think if you've got the passion, it's, the long hours kind of follow naturally, it's not really a problem. Thank you very much. Before we close up, do you have a few words for women in education and women in, en in engineering and research? <laughs> um, I would say that there's, n you know, that uh, women should be aiming at exactly the same things as their male counterparts. Um, I recognise there still is um, a lot of challenges for women which amaze me when I think about how long uh, women have been uh, doing um, science, um, but yet there still are real challenges in, in women uh, representation at all different levels. And um, I think we have to be conscious about it, talk about it, and just make it easier for the next generations. I think the main challenges for women are, are more internal. I don't think they're really, um, I don't think it's to do with sexism in the community. I think it's more to do with women's self-confidence um, and women's ability to sell themselves and, yeah, the, their personal confidence. So I think it's important for mentors to recognise the differences between their female students and staff and their male students and staff um, and really try to nurture women and to nurture their confidence. Yeah, I think I agree with everything that's been said. I, I, I personally, I think I've been lucky. I haven't really ever noticed that, that I was a female and that that was, that was somehow different, but I know that that's not true for everyone. So I think it, it is important to recognize sort of uh, general sort of uh, generalized differences that often occur between men and women, particularly in terms of um, and confidence and uh, yeah, ability to negotiate situations for themselves and uh, to take that into account. And I think also um, sort of later on in many women's career, many issues of work-life balance that come up in academia uh, sort of were innately designed uh, for a situation where um, much of the field was men who had women at home to take care of many things. And I think it's important for us to address those type of um, sort of structural issues, both for men and women to uh, make it easier to have both a productive academic career, but also have um, balance outside of that. And I think that will um, have the effect of improving the retention of women in the field. Thank you very much for being part of the podcast. I would like to thank Alison, Sharon, and Becca for being part of this podcast. And my last words would be to encourage all women who are passionate about science and engineering to, to go ahead, work hard, and be successful. Bye. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. <laughs>